So, in cricket, we've already passed the half century, and my guest for episode 51, a good friend who I finally get the opportunity to catch up with. Um, well, according to his Instagram profile, he's Motorsport, 101, Motorsport 101's lead host and former WTF1's general nuisance. It is the man, the myth, the legend, that I know to <laughs> Vern, Dre, Harrison Drake. Good to see you, buddy. And uh, love to see the My Chemical Romance t-shirt on as well. Oh yeah, I mean, look, my my, my partner got me this, and uh, I, I, I she got me a couple of them when they're, when they're on tour in the US. Um, she is based in New Jersey, so um, I was lucky I was able to get a couple of these as Christmas presents. So I'm very grateful for that. But yes, um, hi Dre Harrison, you may know me from Motorsport 101. You may know me from back in the days of Downforce Radio as well. If you really want to go, go all the way back, yeah, um, Harrison 101, and yes, WTF once former general nuisance. Um, because I was doing a lot over there as well, which I'm sure we'll get into over the course of the podcast. But glad you could have me, Alex. Yeah, me, me and Alex have each other for got over a decade. Um, we go yeah. way back, so um, it was actually really cool to be able to get invited on to Commentator's Corner, and yeah, just 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 really glad to be on the show. So thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I mean, let, let's talk motorsport 101 uh, first of all. Uh, still with uh, RJ and uh, Ryan King, as always. It's great to see that Motorsport 101 continues, in, in many respects, to be very relevant as a motorsport podcast. For for those people looking for the alternative viewpoint, wouldn't you say, in some respects? that uh, It's grown into a monster in that sense. I, I've, I've always joked with people that um, it was a school project that went massively out of hand. Um, because that's kind of what it was. Obviously, we've, we've changed a couple of things around. Ryan King's gone off to now write for Jalopnik full time, so he's only more of a uh, part time uh, host. Um, we, we, when we get King on, we, we get him on occasionally. Um, but Cam Buckley has stepped in wonderfully well. We're very glad to have him with us as well. Incredibly, incredible all round knowledge of motorsport. But yeah, it's just. We've never been afraid to pull punches on M101. We've never been afraid to call to call out a lot of crap when need when needed be. Um, but it's it's been God. This is this is year ten of, of us doing Motorsport 101. This is going to be our tenth season um, covering Formula One, MotoGP, IndyCar, and Formula E now as well. So it's it's been a wild ride. But it's always been it's always been my bread and butter, despite. Everything else has happened with me as a content creator, broadcaster, writer, you name it. Yeah. Um, it's always been my baby. Um, and I'm still very glad and very happy to be able to just keep it going and and now I'll lean on it even more now that uh I am, for lack of a better term, fun employed <laughs> at the moment. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 always been that alternative viewpoint. I've always said that. You know, we are a show made by all walks of life for all walks of life. We're an incredibly diverse group. Mm. We've had some incredibly diverse guests, and we've been able to cover a whole range of series because I, I want us to be the go-to place for a lot of the big series out there, and we're still doing that. Even almost a decade on, we've literally grown up on this. And before I move on real quick, I actually am genuinely proud of our overall record that we've been able to have. Mm -hmm. Almost all of us go on to bigger things like King now writes for Jalopnik, RJ. Um, sadly, he was let go from them, but he was with race fans for for a good time covering them, covering themselves on IndyCar. Lewis Sudderby was with us briefly as well, and he's now MotoGP's world feed commentator. I'm immensely proud of him yeah. as well. So, like, it's it's actually kind of amazing that through the set of us all working together and just keeping ourselves in the industry we've been we've all been able to move on to better things or or at least you know go on towards better things at least partly so it's i'm very proud of it very proud of it yeah i mean coming on to your uh, tenure in 2023 uh, as you said on your instagram profile wtf1's general nuisance or uh, probably general of uh, general nuisance so to speak uh, mm -hmm. you had the <laughs> the opportunity to speak to now departed Haas f1 team principal mr gunter steiner uh, in a wtf1 mm. q and a um, the man's an absolute character, and it's a real shame, obviously, that Gene Haas has let him go. But the man behind everything that we saw on Drive to Survive, he, he's he's a very witty character, isn't he? Everything you see with Gunther, whether it be on TV, whether it be on Drive to Survive, you know, media interviews, he's authentically him. Um, I, I can thoroughly back that up, having 
you know, a good 45 minutes to an hour with the man. And, you know, that was a Q&A for MoneyGram. We obviously, we did, a little, we did a few of our own bits for WTF1 as well. But I got to sit down with him for a good hour. And, like, he was asking me, like, motorsport stuff like how did you get into motorsport dre you a moto gp fan as well like a use your favorite rider and that's the sort of person that he is like do not let the dts sort of vibe yeah take that view to a degree because he really is as authentic as it comes he's a fantastic character um you know he he can be he's very witty very funny um isn't afraid to speak his mind but will always give you him and and I know he was well respected in the Formula One paddock. I know that um, he was just a, just a great interview. Um, again, all, always gave it his all. Always you know, didn't give you any half-assed answers. He he would always speak from the heart. He was always very honest. Um, and I, again, I, I deeply respect that. Like Formula One is a game where everything feels like a big secret. Sometimes everything. If everything feels like characters are almost like fake and and, and contrived to a degree, Gunther was a hundred percent him. Um, I still hold it down probably in my top three of just favorite things I did at WTF one was being able to sit down with him because that was for me the dream, like being able to sit down and talk to people that you thought you could only talk to if you're a proper member of the press or be a proper journalist. Um, so shout out to MoneyGram because I owe them a lot for the opportunities that I got with them because um, obviously MoneyGram being has his title sponsor um, obviously helps. But no, no, Gunther was a fantastic interview. He's a great character. If you haven't read his book, um, Surviving to Drive, I do highly recommend it. It's like a running diary of uh, 2022. Um, and he was very candid about that season, about the Nikita Mazepin difficulties, obviously mm. when Russia declared war on Ukraine and obviously having to deal with that, Mick Schumacher's struggles, the written off cars. And he, he, he was very to the point and very honest with everything. And yes, there is a lot of F-bombs in there. I believe it was something like 270. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm not joking because I, I, when I, was given the, I was given the early copy of the book to interview him. And it was in the form of a PDF. So I could search for certain words. Yeah. So out of curiosity, I Googled the term FOK because he spells it like fuck. Oh, okay. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not even like not even like the English version of, <laughs> of saying the F word, but he actually gave me his alternative spell. I go- and I actually searched the, the document to see how many times it would come up. I believe it was 268 or something silly like that. So if you're if if you think Gunther swears in, in in real life a lot, then wait till you read the book. Let me tell you. Um there is a it's even more than you think it is. It's it would be 15 rated if it was a movie. I'll, I'll put it to you that way. Um you're not getting away with just the one f bomb in there, like 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 a, like a PG thirteen film does, um, but no, Gun- Gun- Gunther was, was was tremendous. He's a great interview, great character, um, and I I think the F one paddock will miss him if he's not back in 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 some other capacity somewhere else because the Haas team was was the Steiner F one team in all but name. Like like Gene signed the checks, but Gunther did all the legwork. Um, when it came to actually running the thing, so I'm I'm, I'm gutted he's gone in that sense because I think the paddock lost a genuine character. Yeah, um, I completely understand. It, it's it's just like everyone would wait with bated breath what Gunter Steiner had to say every time you put him in front of a camera, or you know, like when him with uh, Matteo, uh, the the ex uh, Benotto, the ex Ferrari team principal, you know, like two little kids in a little Fiat Cinquecento driving the streets, speaking in Italian and just <laughs> razzing the absolute shit out of each other. But also, you said about MoneyGram, title sponsor of Haas F1 gave you other opportunities apart from speaking with Gunter, because you're also uh, comparing in front of a live, live audience as well, weren't you? Uh, during your travels. Tell us about that experience because for those wondering, when you're a presenter or a commentator and you're standing in front of a live audience, it is the true litmus test of how people receive you. And you got a pretty decent response, buddy. I'd like to think it went really well. Um, it was it was wild. Okay, I'll let you in a little behind the, behind the scenes story about that. I only knew I was doing that on two weeks' notice. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I to, to fill in the blanks, I had come back from a holiday to New Jersey to see to see my partner. 
um at the time and i'd come i just had i had a, i got a nasty chest infection coming back from the flight back from from philadelphia airport so i was like only like a couple of days back to being a hundred percent and then my boss who was um andrew vanderbert ceo of the race just sent me a text one day and it was like dre are you doing anything like japanese grand prix weekend and i was like no nothing besides the the ordinary where i just do a live stream after the race and I uh, ranked the driver's performances. That was the WTF1 rap show that I was usually doing. Um, and uh, VDB was like, Dre, um, MoneyGram wants to fly you out to Vegas so you can do a live show at their Top Golf. And I'm like, you what? Um, <laughs> so um, amazingly, it was like I had just done I had just done a week in America, and that was like a dream come true for me because I always wanted to do America. It was a bucket list thing for me, and that was cool as hell. And a week later, uh, or oh, two weeks later, I'm being told, "Oh, did you fancy going back?" And it, this this was a weekend in Vegas, and next thing you know. Like two weeks later, I'm packing the bag again. And this was obviously a much shorter. It was only it was only a three day trip, mm-hmm. um, but it, and it was 21 hours of flights. Do you, like I, I warn you, that is not a short trip. Mm-hmm. Um, it is long haul. Like it was 10 hours one way to the other. Um, but I, I I got there and within hours I'm in the biggest top golf in the world. Was the one in Vegas is enormous. It yep. is like if you've ever been to a top golf, the one in Vegas is like three times the size, and the screen is. It's like being in. If everyone knows their NFL, it's like being in the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, mm. where they have that enormous screen in the middle. There was a. It was the biggest screen I have ever seen in that Vegas Top Golf. It is enormous. But we were all down there setting up the live stream, getting making sure all the equipment worked. I had two of MoneyGram's guys in my hotel room, um, making sure that the the slr camera and the live stream tech all worked properly it was manic um a lot of people in that team had to work together to make that happen but yeah like there was about 50 people that stuck and to be fair it was always going to be a bit tricky because it was straight after the japanese grand prix finished and a lot of people just wanted to go home which is understandable because i mean it it was a 90 minute f1 race it start the show had started like an hour and a half before and let's be honest, the Japanese Grand Prix wasn't a classic. Um, <laughs> Max completely dominated that Grand Prix. So a lot of people probably just wanted to go home at that point because they didn't see anything that was massively out of the ordinary for F1 in 2023. Yeah. So I had to stick around with a, with a 50-person crowd. We all gave them, like, cue cards. Yeah, like, so we had, we gave the audience cue cards, you know, just to play along because obviously we were ranking drivers tier list-wise depending on how good their Japanese Grand Prix was. And I distinctively like remember just hitting the button going live and we just did the thing. And like I I was thinking really hard about it and and my girlfriend was there watching and like a bunch of people from ESPN was there as well because Nicole Briscoe was there. She's done SRX coverage and baseball stuff. And like you work my dream job (laughs) and now I've got to try and show off in front of them a little bit and just own a stage. And I just did it and it just clicked. It just worked. And to be fair, I, I owe a huge amount of thanks to Caroline Smith, who I worked with on, on that live show as well, who does brilliant work at F1 Caroline on Instagram. You've probably, if you're an F1 fan, you've probably seen her without even realizing, but she's, she's tremendous and a podcaster in her own right. So again, we naturally could play off each other quite well, but I mean, to say I performed in Vegas, um, even in front of a small audience, is something I can put on my resume for life. That's uh, that's a, just an incredibly cool experience to be flown out and then to perform a live show in in front of you know big sponsors, you know, do, being able to represent WTF one and and you know just make the family proud as well was uh, was an honor. I'm, 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 I was inc- I was incredibly proud of that one. But there is no greater thrill than live performance, <laughs> even even on a small level. Like well, the moment you press the button, it's like a switch just turns on in your head. It is wild. Yeah, I can completely relate to that uh, through my recent trip to Qatar, actually. Um, where I oh wow! The, where, I did, where I was the uh, English English commentator stroke MC for the Mina Karting Championship Nations Cup, and when you are doing uh, when you're hosting the opening and the closing ceremony in front of mm. not only 
the man who is the chairman and founder of the Qatar Motor and Motorcycle Federation. You then got his right hand man, who's the executive director of the circuit and the oh, CEO wow. of the same federation. Oh god! Um, and when you've got not just me speaking in English, but my good friend um, Ahmad Damus, who is from Jordan and is the vo- voice of Jordanian Jordanian motorsport and uh, an award winning disc jockey, doing the Arabic, we sort of really had an understanding of how each other worked. We had we you know when you get when you get to work with someone, Dre, and you instantly get that click. It's like that kindred spirit style of feeling. And for those wondering, the QMMF had three weeks to put that event together. They got the green light. Oof. And then I get a message from uh, someone who we both know and is uh, one of the initial guests of Commentator's Corner. Good old Jake Sanson messages me and says, ah, yes. what are you doing the week before Christmas? And I went, mm, not sure yet. Um, fancy a trip to Qatar. I was like, I'm game. <laughs> yeah, so sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, it, it, even though my my voice was completely and utterly screwed, like literally, I sounded like Batman, but with less of the intensity when he goes, "I am Batman," you know, like on on, oh, yes. on the bits of the camera. <laughs> and uh, it was, it you know, it doesn't matter what audience; it, it can be a live audience. We were live streaming the award ceremonies. Um, we also on that day as well had found out that the Emir of Qatar had passed away. So, oh. Arabic tradition is three days of mourning in every single one of the Arabic nations. Um, and also the fact that when I drove back to the Century Marina from the La Salle International Circuit, which is like literally 15 minutes away, mm. I've just come over like part of the, the, the road network and you're coming over this crest on a bridge. And then I've seen on one of the towers the face of the Emir of Qatar with the uh, Kuwait with the Kuwaiti national flag on the left tower that then fades to black and then the Arabic scrolls from right to left saying our deepest respects for the late Emir of Kuwait who was just passed earlier on today and on that day, and on the day after was National Qatar Day the 18th of December so no official celebrations and quite a bit of an eye opener for me but when you're dealing with people then um Amr al Hanad who is the CEO of um the QMF and also the uh executive director of the LaSalle International Circuit great guy ex endurance racer in sports cars um mm. and he just said he said I didn't know who you were before this week but you're an absolute professional thank you so much for your help this week and Look forward to be working with you again soon. He said, "Don't give us a handshake. Come here, and I'll get this. I'll get this big hug instead." Which just goes to show that hugs transcend religions, nations, whatever, folks. If and big beaming smile on his face. But yeah, there's nothing like that live side of things. But then it's also the same when whenever you've done like live streams on Twitch or or, or on YouTube, you're dealing with a live audience. So, But it's not quite the same when you caught those people's eyeballs directly front and centre on you, is there? <laughs> I've, I've had both. And let me tell you, it's 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 incredibly daunting. Yeah, like I said, like when, when, when I was in Vegas, it was David Parra, who's their head of marketing partnerships at MoneyGram and a lot of their senior team. I met half of them at Silverstone, which to be fair, made it a little bit easy because they were all there at the clubhouse when I, when I was there for WTF1. So I actually got to, I didn't realize that half of the Haas guys were going to be down there until the last minute. It's like, oh, by the way, Dre, um, we've got uh, Hulkenberg and Magnuson coming down for a Q&A. And I'm like, shit, you're kidding. <laughs> um, so, um, now, luckily, all I was in the audience, I was just navigating people around because they had Harry Benjamin over there already to actually ask the questions. Um, but I didn't know that was even coming. So, like, nowhere near the same level as finding out that uh, a seen uh, like a member of the royal family just passed away, and you've now got to you know adhere to an, an entirely set of uh, entirely different set of religious ceremonies and traditions, and you know being able to adapt to that is incredibly difficult on on the fly. But I know exactly how that feels online and offline. Like offline, that was wild, but. I remember my first my first week at WTF one. That was mm-hmm. like I'm I'm not gonna beat around but it was a nightmare. Um, it was like obviously the hype was in the air. That obviously oh god, brand new team. You know Matt and Tommy have, have gone. Um, the problem was was that the bosses at WTF one in their infinite wisdom had decided to take down the goodbye video that uh, Matt and Tommy had put up on their YouTube channel. 
Um, so a lot of people did not know that they had left. So the moment we do our, our first episode of Hot Takes Wednesday, which was on Twitch at the time, um, and they had over 50,000 Twitch followers, and they go live, and, and half the audience is going, who the hell are these two? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of people just did not know that the, whole, that the old team had been replaced. And out of nowhere, I'm now in front of a thousand people on Twitch, uh, and half the audience doesn't know us or had not heard the news that that the old presenting team had all gone. Yeah. Um. So like, there is like that initial dread. It it, it, it can go both ways. You can either just you know shake it off and just act like nothing's happened, which I kind of had to do in that scenario, or you know, you just try and make the most of it because I, again, I know exactly how that feels or in a good way and in a bad way. Let me tell you. Yeah, it, it's, it was, I think it was quite a shock to everybody when there was a lot of changes. And when I saw your name came up, I was like thinking, finally, Dre's got the opportunity to actually prove himself in which you, you know, over 2023, buddy, when, when January 23 kicked off and I was just like thinking, finally, like he's, he's got an opportunity apart from, M101 and everything else that you've been a part of to, to have that chance to really sort of express yourself in front of a new audience. Of course, the first like few weeks, obviously with going live on Twitch for the first broadcast of hot takes and having a thousand people wondering who the hell are these people, you know, it's always about adapting to a certain situation. Like, like you said, just sort of like putting the, bl- the blinkers on a little bit and just going, look, I'm here to to do a job. This is what WTF One have entrusted me to do. How did things evolve over the first like month or two as you started to settle in with the team at WTF One that you 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 got to know and got to work with over over that year with with WTF One before uh, leaving the leaving it in you know just before Christmas. Man, um, <laughs> it was a challenge. It was the toughest challenge of of my. You know, I guess you could say broadcasting career because I mean, I, 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 most of this has been a hobby for me. It was, a, like I said, it was a hobby that got that grew out of hand. Um, and I've been doing this for ten years when I got the email from Andrew Vanderbilt saying, um, uh, "Dre, uh, WTF One's got an opportunity. There's 600 CVs on my desk, but I, I don't want to spend the next three days going through them. Can we see if we can reverse engineer something?" your name came up a lot. And I was like, oh, okay. So people have been listening. Uh, So for me, my attitude was, I can't say no to this because I may never get the opportunity again on this kind of level to do something like this because I've been doing M101 for eight years and never that I, uh, a part of me was thinking, is this it? Like, is this just going to be what it is as a as like a hobbyist project that doesn't actually go anywhere? The fact that someone at the race and the race's CEO was keeping tabs on me and thinking Dre could fit here um, was an honor. And so I was just like, okay, let's do it and let's just see how this goes. The first two months were incredibly difficult. I I, I make no bones about it. Um I've been very honest about this. Um it, it was it was always going to be difficult. And I'll be honest, we botched it. We botched the start. Um I mentioned like I mentioned earlier there was nothing we could have done behind the scenes because Matt and Tommy had always been planning to leave. And it, it's now become abundantly clear that they were going to start their own channel and have full creative control on what they wanted to do. And this is nothing against them. Full power to them. Like it's in, It takes incredibly big cojones mm-hmm. to break away from a massive institution, go it alone, and basically bet on yourself to be able to succeed. I will fully respect them for that because I've been there before myself and I know how difficult that can be. Um, But it was an incredibly difficult thing to do because the communication regarding their departure, whether Katie was going to stay or go because she ended up leaving as well a couple of weeks later. Yeah. Um, And then basically having me, Kieran, Charlie and Hannah as a new team chucked in at the deep end was always going to be incredibly challenging. So my like and my attitude going into it was I don't want to be the next Matt Gallagher because I was gonna be a bit more front facing to start off with. I was gonna be hosting Hot Takes Wednesday with Kieran. That was the plan, and that was what happened for the first couple of months. Um so I was in charge of the podcasting side of things, but I ended up growing into more of a 
do all the video stuff kind of guys. So I was writing their scripts, I was voicing their shorts on YouTube. Um, and that was that ultimately became my role in my time at WTF1, but I was going to be a bit more front-facing. My attitude going into the role was I wasn't going to be the next Matt Gallagher. I wanted to be the first Dre Harrison. That was always going to be the goal. I didn't want to just be a Matty clone um, because me and his presenting styles are totally different, um, and I wasn't going to try and fake it. I was just going to be me and see what was going to happen. I was lucky. A lot of people did know me from Motorsport 101 and knew the sort of person and presenter that I was. So I was a bit fortunate in that sense, but I wanted to just put out good content and I thought the rest would take care of itself. It turned out that, at least in my opinion, I think the stuff we put out was genuinely good in that first two, three month period. But I also think a lot of people audience wise had already made up their mind in regards to what had happened. And I know a lot of people uh, wanted to make the top gear comparison and Clarkson Hammond and May's departure. I can't, I can't lie. It was, that's exactly what it ended up being. And, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's tough to swallow that because if I thought we were putting out crap, I would have been the first person to point out that I thought it was going to be crap. I genuinely don't think that's the case. I genuinely think we put out good stuff. And I think if if Matt Gallagher had made it or if Tom Bellingham was talking over the top, I think people would have still liked it. Mm. Um, I just think because it's such a personality-driven game on the internet these days when it comes to content creators, commentators, broadcasters, journos, you name it. Yeah. It's such a it's such a personality driven game now that the moment that Tom and Matt and Katie departed, I think people had made their minds up that you know um, WTF one was no longer for them, and that's completely understandable. I don't hold any of that against the old presenting team or any of the bosses who hired me. I think that's just how the internet gets down. Um, content creation is a brutal game. Yeah, it is. It is a game that if if you take it personally, it can completely consume you. Um, and it's hard to accept that my time with them was ultimately a failure um, because I was let go. I make no po- again. I'm very honest about it. Um, you know, the podcast lost about half its audience um, almost immediately. You know, again, people had made their minds up. So it almost didn't matter how good or bad my um, uh, the stuff that I made was. Um, people were just waiting for Matt and Tom to launch P1. And when they did, they took off. And again, it's, co- it's completely understandable how that goes. Yeah. All I did when I when I joined was I just wanted to put my own stamp on things and just say, look, this is why you guys hired me. This is the sort of stuff that I do. You know, write articles, do podcasts do video shorts, write good scripts and just hope for the best. And I gave it everything I had. I I, I really did genuinely give it all that I had in that. And it, I'm just, I'm gutted that it didn't work out in that sense. But again, like I said before, I'm, I'm glad I was given the opportunity um, because that is priceless in of itself. Like I, I, I know that hundreds of people would have killed to have been in my position. Um, it's just a shame that you know, like I said, content creation is brutal, and sometimes there is just there's no nice way of handling something when stuff goes wrong. Yeah, completely agree, uh, agree with you there, Dre. I mean, it's like with with me being uh, you know a full time commentator now, having done it for crack. I can't believe this. This is going to be my fourth full season of being in. Uh, and at my age, folks, now Dre's Dre, you're in your early thirties now. I'm in yeah, my I'm 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 46. I'm turning 47 in September, and I Ooh. still have the passion and the drive to do this. Now I was in full time employment, so whilst uh, we'll get on to when you were still doing the uh, you know doing M101 whilst doing a full time job at a bookies, which we'll get into that you know showcasing how difficult it can be trying to pursue that dream whilst doing a full time job. But I was in the automotive industry for two and a half decades, like I keep on bleating on about. But on the 1st of September 2020, I was let go, decided to take the plunge. And my dad went, well, if you feel like you want to go for it, go for it. I'll support you 100% of the way. Here I am three and a half years later, now doing what I love to do, which is commentate on races. And I thought, 
oh yeah, I'm going to get into Formula One and be one of these top journos. Never materialised because I went to 2014 British Grand Prix, had one taste of it, thought, yeah, I enjoyed it, but I felt that there was something missing and then commentary filled that void and here we are now in 2024. But yeah, before getting the opportunity to, to go to WTF1 and Andrew Van Bert from the race giving you a, you know, contacting you, you were working at a bookies whilst doing the uh, doing the M101 stuff. Um, quite a different way when you're trying to pursue that dream of getting into the industry in, in some way, shape or form and pursuing that goal. Um, it's very difficult when you have to work on, you know, at a bookies it was shift work. So you were rotated on every time when you'd be working like multiple days in a row, no real time and you'd still be burning the midnight oil to try and keep M101 going with all the team that you were working with. Um, just tell us from your experience, how taxing was that at times? Because, you know, there'll be times when you're like thinking, uh, yeah, someone's called in sick, you've got to fill in for them. So all your plans for that particular day off go out the window, right? Absolutely. No, you're spot on, um, Alex. Um, yeah, it's it was very tough at times. Um, for those who don't know, like a lot of people think working in a bookies is just sitting down and taking bets all day. And I, that could not be further from the truth. A lot of people just don't like I, I get why because the gambling industry is very sleazy there's a lot of you know there's a lot of money thrown around and it's ultimately exploiting vulnerable people and i again i make no bones about trying to hide that fact it mm. is the truth and i saw it for, and witnessed it firsthand i did seven years in the gambling industry between william hill and paddy power and i did four and a half years at paddy power um yeah, you're absolutely spot on. It was it shift work and juggling that while doing Motorsport 101. I, I had very little free time on my hands. It was sometimes I'd be getting up at six in the morning to open my bookies for a, a, a bookies that opened. Like I live in West London. I've, I live in a quiet part of West London. There was no good reason for my bookies to be open at half seven in the morning. Like, who needs a gambling machine at 7.30 a.m.? It's completely ridiculous. Mm. Um, and, and sometimes I'd be working all the way until 10 p.m., which is legally the latest that any bookies can be open in the U.K. So sometimes it was a 15, 16-hour day. And then I'd be coming home to record a podcast for a Motorsport 101, when, which my American co-hosts loved because obviously they're five hours behind me. It's like mid afternoon, late, like uh, early evening for them. But I'm coming in at 10 30 PM at night for an 11 PM recording. Um, and, and the next thing, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm waking up half my family because I've, I've got to get in podcast mode and start recording at 11, 12. And then by the time you're done, it's one in the morning and you've got to find the hours or find the hours in the evening time or early morning to, to edit a podcast or edit or write an article. And yeah, there were many all nighters. There were many sleepless nights alongside that trying to juggle everything. It's incredibly difficult. And I was the sucker that took all the overtime on and anyone who works shift worker and works in retail knows exactly how that feels where once people start realizing that you're the guy that will take the overtime you're the one that gets like gets five phone calls a week saying dre uh someone needs to close a shop in shepherd's bush dre um someone in hammersmith's gone sick can you come over there and me being the sucker that i am was who didn't want to say no and burn any bridges or piss anybody off would always would almost always say yes. Um, so me working a forty hour a week job was more like forty five to fifty five hours a week, and then doing ten to fifteen more with M one hundred one. M one hundred one did not have a social media strategy for many many years because I was just like get these podcasts out and then just leave it because I just didn't have the time to promote it properly. Um, something I've learned from my time after WTF one has been that a lot of people did not realize I already had my own podcast and had done for many, many years. People just did not know me until I joined WTF one. And that's partly my own fault. I should have tried to find a way to, to dedicate more time towards promoting myself, but I couldn't on Twitter because I was too busy wrapped up in other things. So it is incredibly hard. And like being in the bookies is tough enough. Um, there's barely any such thing as a short shift. Most of my shifts were 1 p.m. till 10 p.m. closes. 
you know, you're working on sociable hours. Sometimes you're working five or six day weeks. Sometimes you're watching Formula One races from your phone because the TV won't show them. Uh, but you've got to watch them because you, you're doing content on the side as a hobby about said races. Yeah. And um, I was breaking the rules, having my phone on the counter, which is a big, this is the biggest no no in retail working. <laughs> but you felt like you had to do it and risk it because that's what I was doing. That's what I was passionate about. So. Yeah, like I could, I could go into the nuances of working in the gambling industry, in the industry for for an own separate podcast if I really wanted to. <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll give you the short version and say, incredibly difficult job dealing with vulnerable people that were losing money, incredibly hard to be able to do that. And hey, if I get another job in media, it might be going down that road again uh, in 2024. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. But yeah like don't get me wrong i did it because i I genuinely love it um if i didn't i would have stopped some time ago and in fact i nearly did at the end of 2022 Mm -hmm. like if anything andrew's email kind of saved me to a degree because at the end of 22 i was kind of fed up i was kind of sitting there going oh is it worth it at this point like is this going to actually get anywhere until i found out oh wait it actually has gotten me somewhere because someone actually believed enough in me to offer a job professionally out of nowhere like like that's the one humble brag i've got about all this wtf1 reached out to me (laughs) it wasn't the other way around it was like i just got an email in my inbox one day saying uh, hi Dre, it's uh, Andrew from the race. Um, can we have a chat? And I'm just like, hey, what? Um, so yeah, it's the one thing I can always say is that they saw my hard work and they saw what we were doing at M101 and took a chance on me, which I will always be incredibly grateful for. But man, it was hard to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, like I said, uh, like I keep on saying, folks, a lot of us who were in this industry, we haven't just walked into it. We've put our heart, our soul, blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, the thing was, I didn't even think about commentary until I met Sanson back at Autosport in 2015. And that was actually the first place where we, where we actually met. I'm trying to remember which year it was. Yeah. Um, must 2015 be... sounds about right. 15 or 16, I think I, it was. I think it was 15, but then we, had, then we probably caught up. And I still remember the the person with the whitest brightest leather jacket i've ever seen in my life with a snap back on his head guilty <laughs> hey but you know what he was the he, he, you know at that point i thought right here's the uh, the most stylish looking individual that i know in modern day motorsports no matter what part of it you see him in uh which was really really cool and obviously we we were sharing snapper stories on instagram weren't we like i think there was one particular year I was actually rooming with Stanson because we were having to keep the costs down because uh, Autosport International at that point, you know, the, the hotel rooms were bloody expensive. You'd have to, mm. you'd have to sort of like fight around. And I would always be, um, I, I'd always be the one, I think there are a couple of, yeah, two years in a row, Sanson and I were roomies in a twin room, literally about 20, 25 minutes away from, from the NEC. But Coming away from motorsport, Dre, uh, a lot of us have very, very supportive families. And you you are an individual who's also very blessed to have a very supportive family as well. 100%. Um, if anything, I've probably taken them for granted over the years. Um, it's it's my own fault because I've, I've kind of been very wrapped up in, in this world of motorsport content creation, chasing that dream gig. Um, you know, I, I have always been very fortunate to have a family that has always said, Dre, we understand what you're going for. It's a dream. Go for it. Mm -hmm. And they, they know how passionate that I've been. For those who don't know me very well, I, I had been making videos in some way, shape or form on YouTube since 2008. Um, when it was video blogs or literally playing Halo 3 with a digital camera pointed at my TV screen. Those sort of horrible sort of early gaming videos of the late 2000s where you're just pointing a camera at a screen because we did we couldn't afford £150 capture cards when we were teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and my brother, my brother Ryan, who has been a massive supporter and champion and admirer of me because of that. And he he was a godsend i wouldn't have been able to do it without him because he's been so incredibly supportive of me over the years and 
my mum and my sister have all, you know, we still live together as a family because London house prices are a bitch, um, but to say the least. Um, but I'm incredibly fortunate to have had them back and support me, even now, obviously off the back of being let go. And, you know, I could have easily just gone back towards retail because that would have been easy. I've got seven years of retail experience on my CV. I would have been able to get a retail job in a heartbeat if I really wanted to. But I am trying to chase other gigs in the media space um, and trying to stay in motorsport where I can. And my mum has, you know, has been the first person to say, Dre, don't worry about the rent so much. Just chase it and just see what's out there and see if you can stick around. You're doing the right thing. So I've been incredibly blessed to have had a very understanding and very supportive family for all these years because I've I have been a disruptive influence over the years. I make no again, I've said it a lot on this show. I've made no bones about admitting that. You know, the late nights, the the noise crowd of being on Discord recording shows and being away from them for a long period of time and I mean, people forget, like WTF1, most of the time I was working from home. It was a remote gig. I wasn't in their office in central London. I was in my own bedroom for hours at a time, whether it be writing, recording, whatever it was. Um, and yeah, like that demanded a lot out of them to, for me to be able to do that. So yeah, I've been incredibly fortunate to have them support me in 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 that way because i know a lot of families that wouldn't do that for me um we wouldn't do that for, for their family as well so no i'm incredibly fortunate to have had them support me and even now to this day um where things are obviously not straightforward but yeah i couldn't couldn't be here without them in that sense and i'm always grateful for them massively yeah and uh Amidst, of, of, of course, having a very supportive family and also being a, a complete motorsport nut. Uh, as you can see in the background, uh, a few Lewis Hamilton editions of the uh, replica helmets, including the uh, Pride Special and also a big lover of the, uh, the good old sneakers, my friend. Uh, many a times, with like, <laughs> I still remember the LeBron 17s, the... Uh, the Pride Month, uh, I think it was the uh, the Air Maxes uh, that you had at one yes. point as well. I did, um, yeah. it, it, it's, it's it's quite funny how through social media you find we find out so much about each other, and I think in some respects, social media we, it's a subject you and I need to talk about anyway because one of the things that I have talked about quite a few times on Commentators Corner is representation. Whether it becomes uh, of minorities, whether it becomes of women in motorsport, uh, of course we've got organisations such as Racing Pride with Richard Morris, Matt Bishop, who uh, you know are doing such great work within the motorsport space. I think that there's still this sort of nagging feeling that there are so many people that just don't think before they voice an opinion that will, I think, in some ways exacerbate others to have the same opinion which isn't really the way of the world as we see it in 2024 i think it's a it's a massively important thing i think one of my biggest breakthrough years as a content creator journalist broadcaster whatever you wanted to call it was 2020 and 2020 was a massively important year not just for motorsport but probably just for people in life in society in general because the murder of George Floyd, I think, awoke something in a lot of people in sports, in greater society, about racial injustice. And look, I make no bones about it again. There are there are not very many black content creators in motorsport. There's there's not many at all. And motorsport has always been a a private endeavor. It's a bit of a closed shop when it comes to letting people in and the opportunities that come with it. Um, and the sport could do a lot better in terms of diversity. And this is, this goes for most sports in general, mm -hmm. but motorsport in particular, when it's a money-driven game, um, could stand to do a lot better. I mean, look, Lewis Hamilton was one of the guys who absolutely pushed that massively when George Floyd was murdered um, and started his campaign, which led to Mission 44 and a bunch of other fantastic diversity initiatives he's done. But it was, I wanted to make the point 
on our YouTube channel um, and talk about the racism that still was lingering within the world of motorsport um, and just talk about how Hamilton has basically been one of two black drivers ever to even get a sniff of Formula 1, really to Ribs being the other one who only tested a car but never actually took part in a race, mm. um, about how the media centres are 90 you know, ninety plus percent white and male. You know, there's there's no getting around it. It is a white man's game. It has always been a white man's game and a lot more needed to be done. So I use the platform that I've got to speak out massively about it. And I'm very glad that a lot of the right people did listen. I was on Jenny Gow's Fast Talkers a couple of times. I was on BBC Five Live talking about the British Grand Prix as a result of that. Um me, I was sat down with people I genuinely admired, like Jess Medland, who's now a senior producer at Sky Sports, was head of WTF1 at the time, ironically. Uh, how these things yeah. turn out in the end, Chris Medlin is one of the best in the business as a journalist for, for Racer.com. Um, you know, I'm just glad that the, the right people listened at that time because, yeah, one of the things that has become a source of pride for me with Motorsport 101 has been, and it's still the pinned tweet on our, on our Twitter account regarding this, is we are a show that's been made by all walks of life. Me and Ryan King obviously are black, and we've been doing this for over a decade in some yeah. capacity. Um, RJ, RJ's partner is trans. Um, you know, We've had people like Remy Connors, who, again, we've had multiple guests on the show who are trans. We've had people on the show that are part of the LGBT plus community. And we've had to have had difficult conversations about inclusivity in motorsport because we've had it shoved in our face directly. Only weeks after the Re-Racers 1 campaign was announced by Formula 1, they talked about a race in Saudi Arabia. Now, there's no getting around that. Saudi Arabia do have compromising laws against people in the LGBT plus community. So you're promoting a campaign that's meant to champion diversity and yet you're taking money from a country that would not accept someone like me if I was gay or if I was anything other than a heterosexual male. And that's something we've had to address and something we've, we've had to talk about. And, and it's, it's never an easy conversation, but I don't like shying away from the difficult conversations because that's, the only way we're going to ever have progress is by talking about these things yeah, and lay, laying it all out to bear. And unfortunately, the industry that I'm in still has a very long way to go. And I'm not for the life of me saying this. You, that means you need to go out and hire me to make a point. I got called a, a diversity hire for WTF1 by many, many people when I got the job because people either just didn't know me, didn't know my work, or just assumed... Because I'm black, I was hired as a, as a tick box exercise. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's done it to appease the left wing because they've hired they've hired a black guy to to be one of their content creators. So it's not, you know, it's so, so he's doing it to appease people, not because of how good I may or may not be as a content creator, but because I happen to be black, and mm -hmm. that is an antiquated racist view of me as a person and the culture that comes with within motorsport that we need to eradicate and if i can lead m101 and do things with that to have people keep an open mind and to have difficult conversations about how to make most sporting entities more inclusive and diverse and i will happily lead that conversation because it's got a long long way to go it's definitely taken a step in the right direction in recent years but we still have a lot of progress that needs to be made. Definitely. Yeah. I 100% agree with that sentiment. Of course, for those wondering, well, I'm not just white. I'm also part Jewish by descent because of my surname, Goldschmidt, German Jewish. Now, for those wondering about Oof. my family history, my great aunt, uh, aunt Lily was halfway on her way to, po to Poland when the allied forces were coming back to Berlin after Kristallnacht, which was a very, very torrid time through the second world war my great aunt lost her business which was a sec uh, funny enough it was a secretarial agency and we are in this day and age and i'm i'm not going to go to town on it but the current situation with regards to gaza and the palestinians of course is a big show of zionism 
which in another way is an inherent form of racism. And my thoughts and my prayers are going out to everyone that has been affected in that area of this country. And a lot of my friends who are from Jordan, who are from Palestine, have been voicing their opinions on social media. So if you're not going to say anything nice about the si- if you're not going to say anything positive about the situation, my advice to you, stay out of the conversation and let the conversation be discussed by people who will know a lot more than those that are uneducated. This is the thing, folks. Diversification also needs a little bit of understanding and a bit of education. So if you can learn a little bit by doing some research, come in with any conversation about diversity or the topics that I and Dre have been talking about over the last few minutes, make sure that you're informed and educated before speaking your mind. If you're a bit more open-minded, a bit more understanding of the facts and the situations that have gone on, you will be respected for saying, okay, I agree to disagree. This is how I see it. And thereby, you can have an amicable, very good debate and conversation without anyone getting uh, flustered, getting the red mist behind their eyes or whatever. Just think about it sometimes before you post on social media because everyone can be a critic. No one can please everybody. And this is the way of the world. So sometimes if you haven't got anything nice to say on social media, my advice to you is don't put it on there because first of all, you'll get you'll get comments from all fronts, from varying different degrees of severity to people actually sympathizing with you. So sometimes it takes you a couple of seconds to think, and sometimes you can make that decision whether your comment might anger people or whether it might put a positive outlook on there. 110%. I mean, on a, on a smaller level, being a Formula One fan on the internet has, has never been more hostile. Mm-hmm. Um, in the last few years, I mean, the obvious is 2021 and how Abu Dhabi played out in the end. And it's I've openly said on WTF one's platforms as well as my own that it's an incredibly hostile thing to 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 enter because if you say anything that could be taken the wrong way by a large member of the Hamilton or Verstappen groups, you will get a lot of shit in your mentions from people arguing the other way because a lot of people have turned being a fan of a driver or a team into their social media footprint um and anything that encroaches that footprint is going to get snapped at defensively and on a large scale level i, com- I completely wholeheartedly agree well let's uh, let's let's wrap up with a few final questions buddy um mm-hmm. at one point well i think you still are even though he isn't in formula 1 anymore the biggest sebastian vettel fan that i know of personally <laughs> Uh, but, it, you know, it was always great to see, you know, you put your two cents about certain things that were happening with Seb in Formula One, whether he was at Red Bull, whether he was at Ferrari. And then his uh, swan song years in uh, in Aston Martin, um, where we really saw the the real sort of bromance, I think I'd like to call it, between him and Lewis. You know, very, very good kindred spirits, uh, very supportive of what Lewis was trying to put across using not just the global platform of Formula One, but his presence as a seven-time Formula One world champion, a man who had beaten pretty much every single odd to become a driver that in his rookie season back in 2007 was one point of winning from winning the Formula One world championship on season debut uh, Mm. amidst the like of uh, a man who'd come out of Renault, got into McLaren, then Spygate happened. We all know what happened back then in 2007. <clears throat> uh, and then became a good friend of his as well, Fernando Alonso. But then, uh, and then, of course, Kimi Raikkonen, who that year took Ferrari's uh, last record, last actual Formula One Drivers' World title, which is uh, quite a worrying thing because we're now three years away from that becoming two decades it's quite frightening when you think about it but Seb has been uh you know a really really big character in Formula One put an an imprint on you but also now that he's uh roaring around in good old red five Nigel Mansell's title winning car from 92 even got the period uh overalls to match but of course is now oh yeah pushing sustainability of course with e-fuels now becoming to the front um what 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 do you think we could see from Seb in the in the coming years? Of course, of 
not just the sustainability push. I mean, he still looks in pretty good shape for a man who's approaching his late 30s. I mean, Lewis, who's nearly 40 himself, is has gone completely plant-based and, uh, you know, just is living how he feels he should be living and still trying to be as competitive as possible in Formula One alongside a very young hotshot teammate in the form of George Russell. But yeah, I think Seb's going to do quite a few wonderful things in the next de- couple of decades to come, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think, as mentioned in our previous question on diversity, I think 2020 opened the eyes for a lot of people. And I think that was one of the big changes was was, was Seb. I think when he was he was one of the people that really became the frontline ally for Lewis Hamilton. And I and I think a lot of people nicknamed him the Paddock's dad for that very reason, because this was a guy who, I remember the early days of Seb. He, he was not well liked by a lot of people in Formula One. I, th- I don't think a lot of people were ready to embrace Seb as a world champion and number one guy in the sport. It was a very predominant Alonso Hamilton crowd back then. And then Seb all of a sudden came in relatively out of nowhere, becomes the youngest ever world champion. You know, the, the the finger point rubbed a lot of people the wrong way as a celebration. Multi twenty one didn't help either. Um, you know, so it took a long time for I think for that stench of Seb winning to go away because I think a lot of F one fans get very tetchy about about dominance. Mm-hmm. So when twenty twenty came along, and obviously a lot of us were having, were having a lot more conversations about race and racial injustice and and how can we make the world a better place. I think Seb, you know, becoming who was already a close friend of Lewis and leaning on him. I mean, people, a lot of people forget taking the knee before the race started. That was partially Seb's idea because he, he was head of the drivers association back then. It was him and Grosjean that had come together and was like, Lewis, how about we do this? And that's what became a key part of demonstrating, you know, racial inequality in Formula One. And yeah, I have my issues with the fact that not the whole grid agreed to do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Seb and Lewis was at the forefront of that. Seb was the one who continued to push for that. He became a great ally. He was one he was the only other person on the grid who had Black Lives Matter as a t-shirt. The actual phrase Black Lives Matter on his helmet and on his t-shirt. And I think that started motivating him towards pushing other important agendas. Climate change is probably going to be the biggest generational battle of our times. You know, we are leaning dangerously towards the point where fossil fuel usage and and sustainability is going to be one of our biggest challenges in the next few decades. And Seb's been at the forefront of that. Um He's done tremendous work in promoting sustainable fuels, in environmental awareness. Just the basic act of cleaning up after yourself at a racetrack was something that he pushed hard. And people listened because Seb realized he's now become one of the most universally liked drivers I can ever remember in Formula One. And as a guy who spent years defending him on the internet because I felt like he had a hard time from people... So for him to, for me, he had the greatest retirement ceremony that I think a driver has ever had in Formula One. You know, he got that stand innovation before the race had started. He was given the microphone after the race and was given an open mic at the end just to promote champion and, and other causes and encouraging people to use their voices and 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 speak out about anything that would make the world a better place and. You know, the fact that all 20 drivers went out and saw him off for dinner, which again, never happens. I was, I've seen pictures of this before. There was always one or two people missing. They all turned out for Seb. I, I, and it was it was incredibly <coughs> touching as, as a Seb fan of the years to see such universal support for him. And I, I, I'll say on the record, I don't think his racing career is quite done yet. I think he'll end up doing something somewhere. I think the itch, maybe the World Endurance championship might be might be the place for him as a as, as a part-timer maybe that'll be where it ends up i don't think his racing career is entirely done yet but I, I i only admire the fact that he's used his enormous platform and the fact that a lot of people do care about him now to push for climate change push for sustainability and of course push for diversity a lot of people don't 
re- don't remember. He was he wore the rainbow shirt in Hungary. Mm-hmm. Um, said Look, if they just to fire me for that, I don't care. I I will do it again. And and he is a fantastic example of an ally for a lot of these guys. Maybe the, these are things that don't directly affect him. He's a rich white guy who has all the success in the world, who doesn't need to do this, has already had a fantastic F1 career. It's one of the greatest ever. And he's still going out of his way to try and make the world better. And he, he was a big inspiration for me to do the to do exactly the same. So I'm very proud to be a Seb fan and I'm and I'm delighted that he got the send off that he I think he always deserved. Um and a lot of people coming round to to his way of thinking and admiring him was was massive for F one and I'm really glad that he got that attention. Yeah, I mean I, I still remember the Australian Grand Prix when he was switched from Toro Rosso where he took his maiden victory at Monza in 2008 and was the first person to win for Toro Rosso, which even won before Red Bull did on the Formula One grid, folks, if yeah, your yeah. memories may escape you. But then, of course, um, what happened a few years later, a certain Frenchman by the name of Pierre Gasly ended up holding off Carlos Sainz a couple of years mm. ago to do the same thing when the team that is now, as of this year, no longer going to be known as Scuderia Alpha Tauri. Real shame, because I kind of like the actual uh, the look and the branding of the cars as well. Uh, they've still got Danny Rick and they've still got good old Yuki Sonoda in for, for, for this season. Uh, but then, of course, people might not remember the time when he mimicked Nigel Mansell with a moustache uh, when he was talking to the broadcast team at Sky Sports F1. Um, and then famously winning his fourth world title at the Bud International Circuit, now raced on by MotoGP doing the donuts and promptly getting a fine from the FIA because of it. Because <laughs> they went, no donuts. <laughs> Seb still went, no, this is my fourth world title. I am going to enjoy it. And we got the uh, the donuts on there. Um, but Dre, one other category we haven't really talked about. And uh, it's MotoGP. Mm. Uh, we'll have a quick discussion about that before we close out the show. Of course, um, Mark Marquez. Dropped the bombshell last year. No longer with HRC. Now the number 93 goes to Grissini Ducati. Peña Banyaya is now going to be defending the number one again with Ducati. Uh, things are looking a little bit spicier this year. Now with the, a few of the driver market switches. And I think it's only going to get spicier because I think we've got a massive free agency coming for this year as well. A lot of the big names are all going to be up for grabs for 2025. Fabio Cotoraro's contract expires. Marquez is only on Grassini on a one-year deal, um, as is Banyaya, Bastianini, Jorge Martin has already teased potentially going to Honda if he, if he can't get a Ducati factory seat. It's going to be wild. It's going to be a very, very fascinating year. And trust me, the sport needed this. It needed something to light the torch paper again. Because, look, I don't, I, I've, I've talked about it on Motorsport 101 a lot in, in the last year. The sport is not in the best of places right now. The on-track product has suffered with the ride height device, is the aero. Um, it's turned into a lot of what they always tried to avoid, and that was being F1, and it's brought over all of the bad traits from F1, um, which is unfortunate, given yeah. that I've said before, MotoGP is, for me, one of the best racing series in the world. Um, and unfortunately, chasing ultimate speed has made their product worse on paper, and I've not been a fan of it. But Mark Marquez on a Ducati is massive for the sport. It needed... I mean, Mar- Marquez is their biggest star post Valentino. There's no argument in my mind about that. Like, Marquez is a freak athlete, a freak talent. But you also, it's easy to forget he's not had a competitive machine in four years. Like, True. when he broke his arm, the, the 2020 Honda was not a great bike. Um, of course, the complications of fixing that arm has led to him losing two, three years of his career on top of that. And then, of course, Honda falling apart as a manufacturer has only amplified those concerns. But he's now on the best bike in the sport. Well, maybe best bike in the sport. We'll have to see what the 2024 Ducati is by comparison, because let's not forget, Marquez is on last year's bike. But it's a buzz. It's a thrill. We saw him in the... I've never seen so many people tune into that Valencia test the day after the season finished 
just to get a glimpse of Mark on a Ducati. I'd never seen anything like it for a test session. This was the Rossi going to Ducati moment um, yes. from, from, from 2010. Um, that's what it felt like to me having Marquez on a Duke. Um, so I am, I'm going to be fascinated to see how he stacks up compared to Banyai, who has been the dominant force in bike racing for the last couple of years. Um, I think the last two years of Banyaya has proven that, yes, he's a fantastic bike rider, but also he is vulnerable. Jorge Martin left opportunities on the table to potentially beat him last year, and Banyaya had to come back from a massive 90-plus point deficit in 2021 um, so 2022, sorry, against Fabio Quattararo, who was dominating the first half of that season as well. So Banyaya is beatable over the course of a season. There is no doubt in my mind about that. So where Marquez fits in, can he transfer that freakish talent to a brand new bike? We just don't know in full, but it's going to be fascinating to watch and see how he fares. You know, we all know that, like, it's like Ronnie O'Sullivan. The rankings may not say so, but we all know he's the best player in the world anyway, <laughs> in the same way that Francesco Bagnaia might be world champion. Yeah. But we all know that Mark Marquez is the best rider on the planet when he's fully dialed in. So I can't wait to see not only how he fares against Bagnaia and Martin, and let's not forget someone, someone like Brad Binder or Marco Bezzecchi could be involved as well. They were great last year too. Um, and seeing where he stacks up, but also does he stay at Ducati? Like what happens for 2025 as well? Because there's a lot of big names that are going to be up in the air and I'm fascinated to see where it all lands up. Yeah. So Dre, thank you so much for jumping on for episode 51 of Commentator's Corner. Folks, all the links for Dre's social media, M101 social media, also their Twitch, their YouTube channel. So if you are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Downforce Radio, you can find all the links there. Like, share and subscribe if you get the chance. And as I always say, If in doubt, flat out, we'll see you very soon for episode 52. Goodbye.